What's up everybody, my name is Addy, and welcome back to Kit Guru. So here at Kit Guru, we love testing the most advanced components and pre-built systems on the market, but that's not always what everyone in the PC market is after. Some people are yet to be fully converted to the PC master race, and the most expensive options may well be out of budget for them. And often it can even scare potential PC gamers off when they see the price compared to games consoles, let's say. That's where CyberPower jump in with their latest offering, and today we're checking out the CyberPower Ultra 33 bundle. That's right, not just a system, but a complete setup all for only £899. Can it really be any good? Let's find out. If you're not subscribed yet, why not? Hit that subscribe button for awesome tech content. For just £899, you're not just getting a capable gaming system, you're also getting a double XL mouse pad, a CyberPower gaming mouse and keyboard, an EPOS GSP300 headset, and an MSI G241V 24 inch eSports gaming monitor. That's a really enticing offer for those looking to get into PC gaming on a budget. Some people forget you need all those extras when you're entering the PC scene for the first time, and the cost racks up if you dump your whole budget on the system alone. Others will say it's cheaper to just get a console, and yes, okay, consoles alone are around £450 for a PS5 if you can find one at retail, but what they're forgetting is they normally already have a potentially expensive TV and sound system for that console to run on. If you didn't have a TV at all, then you're looking around £450 for the console, plus a TV that can cost anywhere from 200 to two grand. So really, 899 for everything you need, other than a desk, is sounding pretty good. For this review, I'll be taking a different standpoint entirely, focusing on the bundle as a whole and my experience with all of it, rather than solely deep diving into the PC's performance. We will, of course, still be going over the specs and running multiple tests on the system to see how well it performs, so stick around until the end. So putting myself into the shoes of a first-time user, I wanted to see how easy it was to get this setup ready to go, and if I ran into anything that may be confusing, as there are quite a few things going on for someone that's never set up a rig before. Now, I started by taking the PC out of the box and noticed there's no accessories pack, and where was the power lead and Wi-Fi antennas, etc. Well, of course I knew, but for someone new to this, they may not. So luckily CyberPower had a slip of paper saying to remove the internal packaging first, which many people do not realize to do, by the way. Taking the front panel off the system was easy, and removing the internal packaging to keep the components safe during transport was also easy, revealing a pack tucked in the front of the fan bay, and this was the missing accessories pack. Now this was pretty self-explanatory after reading the note, and I don't think anyone would really struggle here. So next, I set my peripherals up, saving the monitor for last. I set my mouse mat out first, which I was expecting to be slightly lower quality given the budget, but to my surprise, was actually quite a good size. It was thick and felt super smooth with good edges that won't fray easily. I then unboxed my CyberPower keyboard and mouse, and these were what I was expecting, really. They are completely made from plastic and do feel budget orientated, but I can't say that they felt awful. Yes, the keyboard has some flex, and yes, it does have membrane switches, but you do get a full-size keyboard with handy media keys on either side. It also looks the part with a black and red design with a WSAD keys having red keycaps, which I do like. The CyberPower branding also lights up, which is a nice touch. The same can be said for the mouse. It feels budget being all plastic, but it certainly screams gamer with its multiple extra buttons and white LED zones. It's very ergonomic in design too, and actually feels pretty nice when you're using it. Both are wired with rubber cables and USB-A connections. Now plugging these in again is self-explanatory, and I don't think anyone would really struggle here. Then I moved over to the headset. Now I'm a fan of the funky EPOS designs, and the GSP300 doesn't disappoint. It is black and blue though, and I wish it had been black and red to fit that mouse and keyboard aesthetic, but for the price point, I can't really grumble. You could always set the PC fans to blue to counter that mismatch. The headset isn't USB though, and instead has dedicated mic and headset jack that ideally needs to be plugged in the front IO of the case for extra cable length, but I had no issues plugging it directly into the back of the motherboard. The headset itself is comfortable and adjustable 
adjustable with a flip up and down microphone and a handy volume wheel on the right cup. We're almost done here, but lastly is setting up our MSI monitor. Unboxing the monitor revealed several parts, including the power cables, HDMI cable, the screen itself, the base of the stand, and the stand's arm that connects to the back of the monitor. Four screws are included to screw the section into the monitor, so you do need a screwdriver for this part. The arm slots into the back of the monitor, but there are vase mount screw holes if you wish to attach this to a desk mount instead. After screwing the arm on, I attach the cover that hides the screws and then attach the base, which has a single screw that can be tightened either by your fingers or a screwdriver. Next was simply to plug in the monitor's power cable and then attach the HDMI, which could be a little bit fiddly. After that is ensuring the other end of the HDMI cable goes into the back of the graphics card and not the motherboard itself. This was all nice and easy too, and I really don't see anyone struggling with pretty much any of this, to be honest. Finally, with all fingers crossed, was the time to boot the system for the first time. As you can see, it took a little while to boot for that first time, and I actually began to worry I hadn't plugged the monitor in fully, or maybe there was another issue. But after a short time, the system did boot fine, and then I had to set my standard Windows 10 preferences. Luckily, after this initial boot, the system boots up much faster and doesn't leave you hanging, thanks to the speedy NVMe drive we have inside, but more on that later. So overall, the initial setup of the whole bundle didn't take me too long. It may be about 15 minutes. And honestly, despite my 20 years experience of PC gaming, I think anyone doing this for the first time won't get into any trouble here. Yes, it may take a bit longer to set up, but everything is easy to figure out where it goes. The biggest thing is the initial removal of that internal packaging and the accessories pack. But again, CyberPower do tell you to do this anyway. Before I go on to my impressions and experiences of using the setup as a whole, let's go over the system specs and get some test results, shall we? Spec-wise, we get a CyberPower Auron mid-tower OEM case with ARGB fans and an external RGB and fan remote. AMD Ryzen 3 3200G, which is a four-core processor at 3.6 gigahertz with four gigahertz turbo. We get an AMD Ryzen Wraith CPU cooler, a Palette GeForce GTX 1650 GP, which is a four gigabyte graphics card, MSI B450 Tomahawk Max 2 motherboard, Corsair Vengeance LPX, two times eight gigabytes of RAM, so 16 gigabytes of RAM at 3200 megahertz. A WD-SN550 one terabyte NVMe SSD. An InWin A45 450 watt 80 plus PSU an N300 wireless adapter, and Windows 10 Home. For a budget system, these specs look great. There's plenty of room for upgrades, which we will discuss later, but the parts chosen pair nicely, and it's great to see that WDSN550 1TB NVMe drive there. Yes, it acts as the boot drive, which is why the system boots so quickly, but there's plenty of room for games, and the games will certainly benefit from running from an NVMe SSD rather than a slower SATA SSD SSD or hard drive. Our RAM is reasonably fast as well, and we're still getting 16 gigabytes here, which is ideal for gaming. Yes, the four gigabyte 1650 is a budget card, but this is a budget system and should still be capable of playing games with good performance with some graphics options tweaked. One thing that caught our eye and had us slightly worried was that in-win power supply. It's only 80 plus, which means it's not even bronze efficiency. We contacted CyberPower regarding this and they said it was due to that budget, but we're happy to share some details of the return rate. So what they said is, this particular model of the last 5,000 units sold during 2021, we've had to replace only 59 of them as of today. So we're looking at a return rate of just under 1.2%. So they're a solid PSU for budget ranges. If I compare this to the RM750X from Corsair, our return rate for that is just over 1.5%. 
percent and now that is definitely a reassuring statement not only that but do remember you do have warranty here too which is five years labor two years parts six months collect and return plus lifetime tech support so build wise everything looks to be in order too it has been tidily cable managed inside with plenty of room for airflow i like the inclusion of the rgb fans and there's even an rgb led strip across the top as well all of which can be adjusted via the included remote test wise i'm going to go over the important ones and then focus on the real world fps results so cinebench r23 saw our ryzen 3 score a respectable 3735 during multi-core tests and 943 during single core tests crystal dismark saw our wd sn550 drive outperform the read speed claims of 2400 megabytes per second with an extra 54 megabytes per second which is a great result and despite the fact that there are much faster drives out there we do need to remember this whole bundle is less than 900 pounds and for that i think this is great write speeds also outperform the claim speeds too which is another bonus ada 64 saw our 16 gigabytes of corsair ram score very consistently and highly too with great read write and copy speeds again it's great to see 16 gigs of ram here at 3200 megahertz our synthetic gpu benchmark 3d mark firestrike scored evenly across the board with our 1652 i'll go over real world fps scores last so cpu temps idled nice and low rising to 70 during Cinebench and 61 during gameplay. Considering we have just a tiny Ryzen Wraith cooler here, I think that's pretty good. GPU temps idle nice and low at 33, hitting 69 during gaming and pretty much the same during 3D Mark II as we would expect. Wattage wise, the system idles at 43, rising up to nearly 114 during an extensive Cinebench R23 run, and the most we see is just under 180 watts whilst gaming, leaving us plenty of headroom on our 450 watt power supply. Sound wise the system pretty much doesn't change, it is fairly loud at all times and that's because the fans are just set at a certain speed, so there's no PWM control here. There is an RGB fan remote controller though, so you could turn down the fan speed if you were just browsing or working or anything like that. Now let's go over some real world FPS tests. Usually with a system review, we'd max out the settings to see how much we can squeeze from the components. However, this time around, as I'm reviewing the experience from the standpoint of a new PC gamer, I wanted to show more realistic performance results for how this system is intended to be used. As such, I chose to run games on medium or recommended presets as our GTX 1650 4GB is a lower end card and also we stuck to 1080p only as the MSI monitor is a 1080p 75 hertz screen. Starting strong with Forza 4, we managed to break 100 FPS for the only time during our testing with acceptable 1% lows too. This was with medium settings, dynamic optimization off and V-Sync off as well. The Division 2 often makes systems struggle, but on medium preset, V-Sync off and reduced latency off, we saw a respectable 74 FPS average and just under 50 FPS 1% low. This played excellently and I didn't notice the dips in performance at all. Another strong contester is Resident Evil 2 Remake, using recommended settings with V-Sync off, hitting just below 100 at 91 FPS and almost 70 FPS 1% lows. Again, super playable and the lowered preset still looked great at 1080p. The hardest to run of them all is of course Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Even on medium with V-Sync off, we only just broke 50 FPS and just under 40 at 1% lows, but I must admit even at 50 FPS the experience was still enjoyable. Now lastly we have Doom Eternal, medium settings, resolution scaling off and V-Sync off, breaking 70 FPS here with 54 1% lows. This is a super fast paced game and I think the results were great considering how many enemies are on screen at any one time. It played well and I had fun. Okay all testing aside, how was my actual experience when gaming and using this setup for an extended period of time. Well, I actually loved it. 
budget. And really, I forgot that was even on a budget build. Yes, the keyboard and mouse are very budget, but once I locked into a gaming session, I didn't even realize the lower quality peripherals. They responded greatly. I didn't perceive any noticeable delay or jitter or any unwanted input. I just had fun. I absolutely love the EPOS GSP300 headset. These are more premium than the keyboard and mouse for sure, coming in at around 70 pounds just for the headset. And I like that they chose the headset as a priority here because sound is a seriously key point of any immersion and they were comfortable too. The same can be said for the MSI G241V monitor. The 75 Hertz refresh is great and I believe there's a perceivable difference in comparison to 60 Hertz refresh displays. It runs very smoothly and again, it didn't hinder the immersion at all. I'm glad they put money into the headset and monitor rather than a great keyboard and mouse, which would then lead to poor quality visuals and audio. I also wanted to mention the Wi-Fi card managed to deliver speeds as fast as I'd expect from my home network. It's difficult to strike a balance when really trying to squeeze a tight budget, but I do think CyberPower have made the Ultra 33 gaming bundle very well, and it's very suited for those looking to get into PC gaming the most affordable way. From the peripherals to the internals of the system itself, the performance all round was great, and as I said earlier, I had fun whilst playing all kinds of games games and totally forgot that this was an entirely budget setup. This of course isn't for the hardcore, well-established PC gamer, but it might be for that person's niece or nephew or their own kids of a certain age. Now, what I want to touch on last is the fact that this isn't a dead-end system either. I mentioned earlier about upgrades, and yes, there are upgrade paths here. This setup is to get you started, but after a while you may want to upgrade to get even better performance. The MSI B450 Tomahawk Max 2 motherboard supports AM4 CPUs and with the latest BIOS update even supports Ryzen 5000 series processors. That means you have huge upgrade paths for the CPU alone. You could for instance upgrade your Ryzen 3 3200G to the 6 core Ryzen 5 5600X which is amazing for gamers. We have our one terabyte NVMe drive, and yes, the motherboard only supports one M.2 slot, but it has six unused SATA ports. So there's plenty of upgrades to be made here in terms of storage. You could add more SATA SSDs for game drives or even hard drives for mass storage. The big one here is of course the graphics card. There's plenty of options out there providing that you can find one and have the budget for one, but this will make a world of difference to your gaming performance. Bear in mind though, getting a beefier graphics card will most likely require you to also upgrade the power supply as the system has a 450 watt power supply currently. The 1650 currently used is powered by a PCIe power cable and upgrading to the likes of an RTX 3060 or an AMD 6600 XT only requires a single eight pin. So upgrading to one of these newer cards would be very easy even for a novice to do. As you can see though, there's plenty of upgrades to be made over time and the system will definitely be capable for years to come. Overall, I really enjoyed testing the CyberPower Ultra 33 bundle. It was easy to set up, it looks great, the visuals and sounds are brilliant, and despite it being a budget system, I think it performed very well too, and it didn't spoil my gaming immersion at all. My biggest drawbacks are of course that mouse and keyboard. These are super budget, but costs had to be cut somewhere, and honestly, I'm glad that these were where the cuts were made, as upgrading your mouse and keyboard are easy. The only other bugbear is having to adjust the fans manually via the included remote as the fans themselves are not PWM. However, for those looking to get into PC gaming for the first time, I think the Ultra 33 bundle by CyberPower is an absolutely excellent and hassle-free choice. So what do you think? Let us know down in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, smash the like and subscribe button, check out our merchandise down below and check out our website daily for tech news. I'm Andy, this is Kit Guru. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.